familiar form of speech as, How are ye, Billy old fell? Glad to see you. What'll you take? The old thing? The old thing meant his customary drink, of course. The best known names in the territory of Nevada were those belonging to those long-tailed heroes of the revolver. Orators, governors, capitalists, and leaders of the legislature enjoyed a degree of fame, but it seemed local and meager when contrasted with the fame of such men as Sam Brown, Jack Williams, Billy Mulligan, Farmer Pease, Sugarfoot Mike, Pockmark Jake, El Dorado Johnny, Jack McNabb, Joe McGee, Jack Harris, Six-Fingered Pete, etc., etc. There was a long list of them. They were brave, reckless men and traveled with their lives in their hands. To give them their due, they did their killing principally among themselves and seldom molested peaceable citizens, for they considered it small credit to add to their trophies so cheap a bauble as the death of a man who was not on the shoot, as they phrased it. They killed each other on slight provocation and hoped and expected to be killed themselves, for they held it almost shame to die otherwise than with their boots on, as they expressed it. I remember an instance of a desperado's contempt for such small game as a private citizen's life. I was taking a late supper in a restaurant one night with two reporters and a little printer named Brown, for instance, any name will do. Presently, a stranger with a long-tailed coat on came in, and not noticing Brown's hat, which was lying in a chair, sat down on it. Little Brown sprang up and became abusive in a moment. The stranger smiled, smoothed out the hat, and offered it to Brown with profuse apologies, coached in caustic sarcasm, and begged Brown not to destroy him. Brown threw off his coat and challenged the man to fight, abused him, threatened him, impeached his courage, and urged and even implored him to fight. And in the meantime, the smiling stranger placed himself under our protection in mock distress. But presently, he assumed a serious tone and said, Very well, gentlemen. If we must fight, we must, I suppose. But don't rush into danger and then say I gave you no warning. I am more than a match for all of you when I get started. I will give you proofs, and then if my friend here still insists, I will try to accommodate him. The table we were sitting at was about five feet long, and unusually cumbersome and heavy. He asked us to put our hands on the dishes and hold them in their places a moment. One of them was a large oval dish with a portly roast on it. Then he sat down, tilted up one end of the table, set, down, set two of the legs on his knees, took the end of the table between his teeth, took his hands away, and pulled down with his teeth till the table came up to a level position, dishes and all. He said he could lift a keg of nails with his teeth. He picked up a common glass tumbler and bit a semicircle out of it. Then he opened his bosom and showed us a network of knife and bullet scars, showed us more on his arms and face, and said he believed he had bullets through, through bullets enough in his body to make a pig of lead. He was armed to the teeth. He closed with the remark that he was Mr. Blank of Caribou, a celebrated name whereat we shook in our shoes. I would publish the name, but for the suspicion that he might come and carve me. <laughs> he finally inquired if Brown still thirsted for blood. Brown turned the thing over in his mind a moment and then asked him to supper. With the permission of the reader, I will group together in the next chapter some samples of life in our small mountain village in the old days of desperadoism. I was there at the time. The reader will observe peculiarities in our official society, and he will also observe and he will observe also an instance of how in new countries murders breed murders. Mm -hmm. Chapter forty nine Fatal sh Shooting Affray Robbery and Desperate Affray A Specimen City Official a marked man, a street fight, punishment of crime. An extract or two from the newspapers of the day will furnish a photograph that can need no embellishment. Fatal shooting affray. An affray occurred last evening in a billiard saloon on C Street. 
between Deputy Marshal Jack Williams and William Brown, which resulted in the immediate death of the latter. There had been some difficulty between the parties for several months. An inquest was immediately held and the following testimony adduced. Officer George Birdsall, sworn, says, I was told William Brown was drunk and was looking for Jack Williams, so as soon as I heard that, I started for the parties to prevent a collision. Went into the billiard saloon, saw Billy Brown running around, saying if anybody had anything against him to show cause. He was talking in a boisterous manner, and Officer Perry took him to the other end of the room to talk to him. Brown came back to me, remarked to me that he thought he was as good as anybody and knew how to take care of himself. He passed by me and went to the bar. Don't know whether he drank or not. Williams was at the end of the billiard table next to the stairway. Brown, after going to the bar, came back and said he was as good as any man in the world. He had then walked out to the end of the first billiard table from the bar. I moved closer to them, supposing there would be a fight. As Brown drew his pistol, I caught hold of it. He had fired one shot at Williams, don't know the effect of it, caught hold of him with, my, with one hand, and took hold of the pistol and turned it up. I think he fired once after I caught hold of the pistol. I wrenched the pistol from him, walked to the end of the billiard table, and told a party that I had Brown's pistol and to stop shooting. I think four shots were fired in all. After walking out, Mr. Foster remarked that Brown was shot dead. Oh, there was no excitement about it. He merely remarked the small circumstance. Four months later, the following item appeared in the same paper, the Enterprise. In this item, the name of one of the city officers above referred to, Deputy Marshal Jack Williams, occurs again. Robbery and Desperate Affray on Tuesday night, a German named Charles Herzl, engineer in a mill at Silver City, came to this place and visited the hurdy-gurdy house on B Street. The music, dancing, and Teutonic maidens <laughs> <laughs> awakened. <laughs> you like that, huh, Esther? Teutonic maidens. Yeah. <laughs> awakened memories of fatherland until our German friend was carried away with rapture. He evidently had money and was spending it freely. Late in the evening, Jack Williams and Andy Blessington invited him downstairs to take a cup of coffee. Williams proposed a game of cards and went upstairs to procure a deck, but not finding any return. On the stairway, he met the German, and drawing his pistol, knocked him down and rifled his pockets of some $70. Herzl dared give no alarm, as he was told, for the pistol at his head. If he made any noise or exposed them, they would blow his brains out. So effectually was he frightened that he made no complaint until his friends forced him. Yesterday, a warrant was issued, but the culprits had disappeared. This efficient city officer, Jack Williams, had the common reputation of being a burglar, a highwayman, and a desperado. It was said that he had several times drawn his revolver and levied money contributions on citizens at dead of night in the public streets of Virginia. Five months after the above item appeared, Williams was assassinated while sitting at a card table one night. A gun was thrust through the crack of the door and Williams dropped from his chair riddled with balls. It was said at the time that Williams had been for some time aware that a party of his own sort, desperados, had sworn away his life, and it was generally believed among the people that Williams' friends and enemies would make the assassination memorable, and useful, too, by a whole destruction, by a wholesale destruction of each other. However, one prophecy was verified at any rate. It was asserted by the desperados that one of their brethren, Joe McGee, a special policeman, was known to be the conspir conspirator chosen by lot to assassinate Williams, and they also asserted that doom had been pronounced against McGee and that he would be assassinated in exactly the same manner that had been adopted for the destruction of Williams, a prophecy which came true a year later. After twelve months of distress, for McGee saw a fancied assassin in every man that approached him, he made the last of many efforts to get out of the country unwatched. He went to Carson and sat down in a saloon to wait for the stage. It would leave at four in the morning. But as the night waned, 
and the crowd thinned, he grew uneasy and told the barkeeper that assassins were on his track. The barkeeper told him to stay in the middle of the room then and not go near the door or the window by the stove. But a fatal fascination seduced him to the neighborhood of the stove every now and then, and repeatedly the barkeeper brought him back to the middle of the room and warned him to remain there, but he could not. At three in the morning he again returned to the stove and sat down by a stranger. Before the barkeeper could get to him with another warn warning whisper, someone outside fired through the window and riddled McGee's breast with slugs, killing him almost instantly. By the same discharge, the stranger at McGee's sight also received attentions which proved fatal in the course of two or three days. It did not so happen, but still times were not dull during the next 24 hours. 